everyone. Welcome back uh, to this amazing series. Last time, we showed that the uh, coins, the Islamic coins, debunk really early Islamic history. Today, we're going to so, uh, show that early rock inscriptions will do exactly the same. With me here in studio to do that and to unpack it for us, Dr. Jay Smith. Welcome back, Dr. Jay. Thank you. So good to have you back again. So what about the rock inscriptions now, since we talked about the coins already? Again, we need evidence that is material that we can look at that is able to withstand the vagaries of time. And this is the coins can do this. So can rock inscriptions made out of rock. They don't disintegrate. They don't deteriorate. And that's why it's important when you look at the rock inscriptions. I want to go up to the map. Take a look at this map here. And you notice uh, the rock inscriptions on this map, the ones in the north. The north are the ones that are from the 7th century. The ones in the middle are from the 8th and 9th century. And the ones in the south are from the 7th century. So north and south are 7th century. And then finally the rock inscriptions start to appear in the 8th century. And it's these rock inscriptions that you have uh, this man here, Ilk Ilka Lindstad, who did his doctoral thesis on it, looking at 100 years of rock inscriptions. And what he was looking at was primarily from 640 to 740 that 100 year period. Well, 640 is about the time when, uh, if Muhammad had been living, it would have been about the time that he died. Up until 740, that's about the time the Umayyads are de declining and the Abbasids are about ready to take over. So we're talking mainly about the Umayyad period and the rightly guided caliphs. That's the time period because this is the time period of really Umar, Uthman, and Ali, and then of course the Umayyad period with starting with Mu'awiyah. So that's important because this is the early Islam. This is how Islam began. The rock inscriptions that he's looking at are right in that time period. And what does he find? Well, it's important that we ask this because when you look and see what he finds, he notices that all the ones prior to 690, so all, that means the seventh century, let's just say seventh century, all the rock inscriptions that are in the north and in the south, that means up where the Byzantine area is, that's where uh, Jordan is, that's where Lebanon is, that's where Israel is today, parts of Syria, all the way up to Damascus, all the rock and scrims you find there are Arabic. These are all in Arabic, and they're Nabataean Aramaic Arabic. So they have the Tarmar Buta, they have the Aleph Maksura, they have these endings that you don't see down in Mecca, Medina. You wouldn't see this kind of Arabic. We talked about that earlier in one another episode. That Arabic would have been Sabaic Arabic, much further south. And so when he's looking at this Arabic, these are usually rock inscriptions on people of people who are on their way on a pilgrimage. They're going somewhere, and on a pilgrimage, they're they're having and they're having professional uh, hammer out these these prayers. These are prayers. These are formulas. There is a bismillah, the yeah. bismillah al-Rahman al-Rahim, which is praise unto God, the compassionate one, the merciful one. Right. So that is not, it's not like that at all. That comes much later. These are bismillah. They start with bismillah. And remember, Muslims say, well, ah, Allah, see, that's Islamic. No, Allah is the name for, in Arabic, for every God, for every religion. So the Christians in Arabic, they would use the name Allah. It just as a generic title. It means the God. It could be any God. It could be Dushara, which is where the original Allah Allah came from. The Dushara is the Nabataean Allah. So it, that, in, the, in these cases, with these inscriptions, Dushara is the God it's referring to because these are all found in the Nabataean area where Dushara would be the name, Allah would be the title. There's also Bismillah also to Alat, uh, who, which is the title for Al-Uzza. Al-Uzza is the feminine form, the feminine goddess, the wife of Dushara, whose title is Alat, which is the feminine form of Allah, as you know in Arabic. So being Arabic, if you look at the word, if you look at the title, you can see these all have antecedents. That would make sense. And this is what he found prior to 690. But then as he moved on and went past 690, once he got into about 710. So now we're getting in, we're now uh, moving into Abdul Malik's reign. He's now, um, he, di he dies in 705. Al-Walid takes over. And if you look at the rock inscriptions, this Muhammad that was introduced on the coins in 691, also on the pro uh, Caliph of Protocols in 691, and also on the Dome of the Rock in 691, 692, mm -hmm. they suddenly, this Muhammad starts to appear over and over again, this praise when this praise when this praise one. So it's starting to become a person. Right. What Go I was going to say is, is it, it seems here right now when you look at this, yet another evidence is that if Muhammad was so popular, if the Shahada was so popular, if the Besmala was so popular, why the silent years? Right? It could have started almost immediately. You would have expected it from the, from the time of the early exactly. 7th century because that's, he died in 632. And then we find him north, not 
where Islam allegedly started. And we find him as a title for Jesus. We're right. going to see that yeah. in the next slide, in the next right. episode coming up. Right. I mean, in some ways, we are, I'm kind of jumping the gun on this. But this idea of him as a prophet only gets introduced in around 710. We're now in the 8th century, not in 632 when he supposedly died. And he's not in Mecca and Medina. This is much, much further north. What's interesting is the, the Muslim prayers, the rites, the passage, the five different what when you know is deen, you teach that in your course, the deen of Islam, which are the prayers, the pilgrimage, the fast, the Ramadan fast, the prayers, the salat, uh, the, uh, the, the pillars of Islam, the hajj. Yeah. These are all be starting to be introduced after 710. For the next 10 years, these start to get introduced. We thought that that was there at the very beginning. We thought that Adam and Eve did this. We thought that Abraham did this. No, they only start to be introduced in the 8th century during the Umayyad period. So this is starting, you can see the sequence. And then finally, not till 720 to 730 on the inscriptions, very late, obviously, did the name Muslim come uh, start to be used as a person and Islam start to be used as a religion in contradistinction to Christianity. So this idea of a religion that is actually opposed to Christianity, that is against Christianity, that people are now saying people, uh, the Muslim really means someone who is subservient, someone who is obedient. Islam means to be in obedience and to be submissive. That idea is not introduced till 720 to 730. That's hugely late. Now, what does this mean? Well, it was only in the 730s, really, and onwards, that there is evidence of a popular devotion to Muhammad as a prophet and a messenger, which makes the Islamic traditions incredibly awkward. This stands right against the standard Islamic narrative. It goes against all of this. The standard Islamic says that all of these were introduced by Muhammad himself. That's correct. He was the first Muslim, uh, not the first, but he would say he well, was the, the Quran one. did declare him to be the first Muslim among many other things, but it's Bring a contradiction, it of course. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And this idea of Islam in, in, uh, but it was, should have been around when Muhammad was living, it does not get introduced till at least a hundred years later. Now, But even all of that, Jay, what I'm trying to say, why can't we find these inscriptions down south, meaning around Mecca and Medina. Nothing. I mean, you would expect it to be around there. At least, sure, you can find it north. You can say, oh, because the expansion. But why is it concentrated north around, suspiciously, the time when we've been saying Abdul Malik played a major role in that? There's one answer and yeah. one answer alone. Yeah. There's no water. Yeah. It's as I simple mean. as that. Isn't that lovely? All you have to do is that, that destroys no Mecca, you know, that destroys the it destroys early everything. history of Islam, everything. Can you then see why you need to use this? Now, look at the coins. What we did in the last two episodes, the one before and now this one, we're looking and we're asking a very simple question. And this is the question proved to me from the seventh century that there is someone named Muhammad, that there right. is a religion called Islam, that there are people called Muslims, that there is a book called the Quran, and that there is a place called Mecca. That's the five things we've been asking. That's the evidence we're looking for, because Islam needs those five. Right. Take away any one of them and it eradicates the Islam. So, you can support the uh, Petra thesis, you can support the Jerusalem thesis, but you cannot support the Mecca thesis. No, in fact, we can now show just the opposite. And what was fascinating when we had that thrown at me that the absence of evidence does not mean evidence of absence that was thrown at me back in 1995, we're now turning on its head. Where there is no absence of evidence. We have all kinds of evidence. Right. The best evidence in the world because these are coins. Coins you can have in your hand. You can look at them today. I remember when I started introducing the coins back in uh, 2020. So we're talking about two years ago. I started introducing the coins on Fander Films. And I was just reading article after article after article after having gone down to the British Museum and seen the, the problem they had because they were attributing something to Mu'awiyah that actually, actually came from Abdul Malik. And I saying, you cannot, that was 30 years too early. And Hatun Tosh noticed it and asked me to talk about it. So I did a whole series of uh, films on it in two, early 2020, suddenly I started looking at the comments and I started hearing people who were, uh, who were actually saying, I'm a numismatist, I am an expert on Arab coins, and you are absolutely right, but we can understand what we're looking at. So I found out who these guys were and I emailed them and I said, okay, why is it you're having a problem? He says, well, we can't fit the standard Islamic narrative onto these coins. They just don't work. I said, well, forget about the standard Islamic narrative. Those only cut start in Bidus in the ninth, 10th century. Now tell me what the coin's saying. You're the experts. You're the ones that can read it. Tell me what the Iraq inscriptions say. Tell me what Ilinstad Il 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 is saying. They're the expert. You're the ones who are reading it. Just tell me what they're telling us. And they started telling me. And I said, well, then use that. 
Forget about the start impo stop imposing what you can't impose onto these coins and these inscriptions. Let the inscriptions tell you. And if we which need just shut up and stop mimicking and mark um, and uh, uh, parroting the standard Islamic narrative and let the coins speak for themselves, what are the coins telling us? There was no Islam, there were no Muslim, there was no Muhammad, there was no Quran, there was no Mecca. It's as simple as that. Amen. That's uh, what uh, it's all about. Uh, it's basically there is no such thing as a standard Islamic narrative that could be supported with evidence. In other words, absence of truth is not evidence of truth at all. Until next time, have a blessed day. Music